We finished up the last video by thinking about the electric current that was being generated when we pushed a uh, bar down a uh, pair of rails. I pointed out there that it wasn't practical to use that for energy generation because you would have to have the rails basically be infinitely long and that just isn't feasible. <clears throat> so how do we make it feasible? One way we can make this feasible is to put in a wire loop and in practice you often have a whole bunch of windings. So again we're going to be looking at our wire loop edge on like so. So I'll go ahead and label it. So we have a uh, wire loop that we're looking at edge on here and you can think of again like a card like, like looking at an index card or something like that. The wires would be wound around the perimeter of the card <coughs> and you're basically looking at the at this whole assembly edge on. Now if say we have somebody turn a crank or we go ahead and uh, run, you know, have Homer Simpson run his nuclear power plant to boil a bunch of water, to spin a turbine to turn the, to turn the um, coil or whatever, um, as it's passing through a magnetic field. So this could be like a yoke style magnet that comes around on the back side and leaves a gap in the middle. But there are a zillion different designs out there. As this goes around, this bit here and this bit here, um, the, the in and out bits, are going to be having a motional EMF generated. They'll start shoving a current along. So the way I've got this drawn here, we would be flowing a current into the... Actually, let's use a different color there. Um, if we think about hypothetical positive charge carriers moving in a sort of generally upward-ish vibe. Um, point your index finger along this way, uh, turn it so that your uh, field fingers are going to the right. You'll see that your thumb points in, which means that conventional current um, would flow into the screen over here. And by the same token, it would flow out of the screen over here as it's going around and around and around in the coil. Now what you do is, instead of it being just a completely pure coil, you will go ahead and attach a pair of wires. You, you had The coil had to start from somewhere and end from somewhere, so if you take the leads of the coil and you run them off, if you're really clever when you do this, you can connect these things to contraptions called slip rings. And once again, sorry for atrocious art that's about to happen. Oops. Um, yeah, maybe we can draw a slip ring. There we go. There's one slip ring. And then over here... Oops, would be the other slip ring, like so. And these are basically free to spin around as these leads are spinning around while this whole thing is spinning around. And these slip rings would come in contact with devices called brushes, which they don't usually look that brush-like, but I'm assuming there is a historic reason for the name. So as these slip rings spin around, they slide against the brush. So electrical contact is made <coughs> while this is spinning around, but it keeps the wires from getting tangled up. And then what ends up happening is we just go ahead and complete our circuit through whatever load. We can maybe go stick a toaster here or something like that. And that will finish the uh, load, current will flow through it and complete the circuit. Now, 
if we think about this as we go through a half a turn if it, at first this wire is moving in general this bit of armature here this bit of a coil here was moving in a generally upward ish way as it turns on the top and goes down that's going to reverse the direction of current through this bit so this means that actually the current is going to keep sloshing back and forth through the load as we keep reversing which um, leg of the coil um, is going in which direction. So because the current um, keeps reversing direction, this is known as alternating current, and that is what AC stands for. Everything we've been looking to date is what's called DC, or direct current, when the charges only flow in one direction. Um, typical household wiring in most of the world um, is AC. There are a few random exceptions here and there, but it's mostly AC. And we will be getting into that later as we explore AC circuitry. All right, now, some, actually before I completely turn away from this, something to think about is as this coil is turning, let's pick maybe a different color here to help clarify this. As this coil is turning, say when it's right here, the number of magnetic field lines passing through it is different than I want to say here. And certainly here, when it was like this, there were no magnetic field lines passing through it at all. So the number of magnetic field lines is changing. And this should be uh, going through the coil. And this should kind of harken back to Faraday's experiment. Remember when we energized the primary coil, what we had was a varying magnetic field, and that wound up inducing um, an electric field that uh, shoved the charges around in the other coil. It seems reasonable, and in fact is correct, that we should maybe be able to extend that formulation to say even for a situation like this, where the reason why the number of field lines going through the coil is changing it's because the coil itself is churning. Um, it still seems reasonable that maybe we can extend that observation that Faraday had, and this would be correct. So on the first step to that, we are going to go ahead and define magnetic flux. <coughs> so it's defined very similarly to how we defined electric flux, and its purpose is basically the same. It's to count the number of magnetic field lines going through some area of interest. So, say, if this is my area of interest here, say some loop here, um, we have a lot of magnetic field lines passing through it here. Um, actually, let's just keep extending the lines. Um, and we can go ahead and, oops, maybe say at some later point when we're turning the coil, uh, turning the loop, that it was oriented like this, and then at some later point like this. Well, we have fewer lines going through here, and in fact, flat out zero lines going through here. So it seems natural to do exactly like we did with the electric field, or uh, with the electric flux, and we would go ahead and define the magnetic flux, where again, triple equal sign means by definition, to be the magnetic field strength dotted with the area vector. I mean, actually, I'll, yeah, B dot A. <coughs> um, so the area vector um, points perpendicular um, to the... Uh, surface in question. So say here, the area vector would be pointing in exactly the same direction as the magnetic field. So this would be an angle of zero degrees. Um, here the, maybe this is, I don't know, 45 degrees, something like that. 
and here this is maybe 90 degrees or something like that so again remember since this is a dot product we can say that this is b times a times the cosine of phi um, a dot product is always equal to a scalar quantity now you're right there is some ambiguity as to which way the area vector should point here i drew it like this there's no particular good reason why it couldn't have been like that which would give a sign ambiguity however it'll turn out that most of the time what we'll be worried about is um uh whether the uh, is for a entire closed surface and there the conventional choice is that the area vector always points to the outside All right, so now with that thought, we will uh, make sort of a pit stop on the way to developing uh, Faraday's law of induction. Um, and this is known as Luntz's law. Um, sort of a predecessor thought to it. And we've saw this before when we saw how the magnetic field was changing and that gave rise to an electric field that had electric field lines that were circularly oriented and they're either clockwise or counterclockwise or whatever. Now in practice the way we know that these electric field lines exist is because they are causing a current to flow through a loop. So I am going to give you the very long-winded observation that Lentz made um, about the direction that the currents flow. So it goes, there is an induced current in a closed conducting loop if and only if the magnetic flux through the loop is changing. The direction of the induced current is such that the induced magnetic field opposes the change in the flux. Okay, that's a mouthful, and we will certainly be working examples of this. Um, but let's just start to enumerate the ways that we can see a magnetic flux change. So one way, so ways to change phi sub b. Um, the whoops, the first one that I can think of. Here, yeah, let's do it like that. Um, first one I can think of is if the magnetic field through the loop changes. The second way is if the loop changes in area or angle.
for instance, if it's got a bunch of articulated joints and you had it open out to some sort of polygon and then you squish it into some sort of a star shape, you would probably decrease to the area. That would be changing the flux through the loop. Changing the angle, that would be like what we saw with the AC generator. We're just changing the angle the magnetic field makes with the area vector. And then finally, the last one is the loop moves in into or out of a magnetic field. If you're somewhere where there's no magnetic field lines and you move to somewhere where there is, well then the number of field lines that went through the loop changed. Now this bit with Lenz's law is very, is a mouthful to read. <clears throat> what I like to kind of hang my metaphorical hat on is to think that the induced current is trying to create a magnetic field that attempts but fails to keep the number of magnetic field lines going through the loop a constant. So let's try to do a couple examples of this and I'm really sorry about how the 3D drawing is probably going to go for us. Um, so let's imagine that I have a bar magnet here. Um, we'll make this the south end, we'll make this the north end here. And let me define a plane here. like so. And then I'm going to stick a loop of wire in this plane. So if we go and take a look at the magnetic field lines that are uh, going, that are, are coming out of the uh, magnet here, coming out of the North Pole, we're going to see like a magnetic field line that does, oops, we're not going behind the that part of the loop there. Say so does this and then maybe does this and then maybe does this and then similarly over here. Okay and then of course the field lines are looping back in up here because it's a dipole and in fact we're running within the magnet. All right, so now let's go ahead and move that bar magnet downward. So I'm just gonna indicate it like that. So if I move this downward, so I'll just draw like this to indicate that we moved it downward. What does that do to the density of, to the number of magnetic field lines that are going through the loop here? Pause the video and get back with me. Okay, so what it's going to do is it's going to increase the number of lines. And how is that? Well, I didn't draw all the lines. Some of these lines here before missed the loop altogether <clears throat> on their way back to looping in up over here. If I bring this down, now this line that I drew right here will actually now pass into the loop, as will all the lines that did before. So what we see here is that the magnetic flux in this situation is increasing. All right, so what does this mean? Well, the, this means that the coil wants to try to keep the status quo with the number of magnetic field lines going through it. It will not succeed, but it's going to try. And so what it's going to do is the current through the loop is going to um, move in such a way that, uh, let's see, let's do purple here. 
that the loop itself is going to generate a magnetic field pointing up. Here, we'll just label it over here. So we'll call this the induced magnetic field. Um, I'll try to make it a little more blatant to see. There we go. It's going to try and do some magnetic field pointing up. So if you remember from the video when we took a look at the electron that was uh, moving around in magnetic field, <coughs> I showed you that with a loop of wire, you could find the uh, direction of the magnetic field that got produced by the current if you took the thumb of your right hand and laid it along the loop in the direction current was flowing. The way your fingers would curl inside the loop would point in the direction of the magnetic field. So here we need, the, need this to point up. And here is where I'm going to be attempting to draw a hand and we will probably all have deep regrets about the experience. I'm sorry. So what I imagine doing here is with your right hand, we're placing your thumb. We're just trying to find a direction here. It turns out I'll be guessing correctly here. But we're trying to draw in thumb like this. And what's going to happen is your fingers are going to be curling out of the... Um, uh, uh, curling out and sort of pointing up-ish. Okay, I tried. I'm sorry. Um, so here, since I had the fingers of the right hand pointing up, this means I guessed correctly about which way the induced current must be flowing. So that means that the induced current is flowing around like this. So if we were to um, look down from above on this, we would be seeing the current flowing counterclockwise. And this is indeed consistent with what Faraday observed. If the number of magnetic field lines in some region is increasing, we induced um, electric field lines that were circular in orientation and oriented, circular in shape and oriented counterclockwise. So sure enough, we are inducing a current here. Now we can also do this by thinking about motional EMF. Um, we can shift to a reference frame where we imagine the uh, magnet isn't moving, but the coil is moving towards it. Um, in that case there, you should be able to convince yourself that the magnetic forces would be shoving the charge around. So there's some sort of an equivalency here that we need to flesh out. Okay, similarly, if you were to move the bar magnet away from the loop, you would induce a current in the opposite direction. This is because then if you're moving away, um, the number of field lines going through the loop is decreasing. You would need the induced field from the loop to point down, which means that that induced current would have to be going clockwise when viewed from above. So just to maybe make this a little more concrete, let's do one more example here where the, oops, um, where the coil is doing the moving. So I don't want my bar magnet this big. There we go. That's good. North, south. All right. So in this region here, doo -doo -doo, um, this is going to look like a dipole. Something like that. So if we, again, here, let me draw a plane just to help us with the visualization here. Um, let's go ahead and have a loop oriented in the plane. 
So around he about here, the flux through the loop is roughly zero. Um, lines are either just grazing the loop or they're coming in and they're going out. But as we move the loop, say from there to here, now some of the lines from here are going through the loop and have to exit the loop before they can come back around. So this means that we are seeing an increasing magnetic flux pointing up. So this means that we need to have an induced field that points down, which means when looking from above, we need the uh, current to be flowing around clockwise. Now, when you're right at very dead center, here the number of field lines going through would be an inflection point. So say we draw this again right here. The number of field lines is inflection points at a max. And so at this point, the current is zero. Then when I go over here, the number of lines is decreasing. So now we want to induce an upward pointing a magnetic field to try to um, offset that. Um, oops, there it is. There, there we go. Hmm. There we go. Be induced. And so here, the induced current would be flowing counterclockwise when viewed from above. And then eventually as we go away here, the, the magnetic flux tapers down to nothing. So we'll see a current increase to some max just bef before we get to the center point, drop to zero, then start flowing in the opposite direction, getting to the center, getting to a max somewhere a little off center, and then decreasing as we pull away. Now, <clears throat> this stuff takes a bit of uh, practice here. So I've often recommended that when you're learning Lentz's Law, it's not bad to just plain make a little crutch. Um, so here is my crutch for Lentz's Law. And all I'm recommending you do is you get yourself an index card or something like that and just make the following uh, four diagrams. Um, here we will have magnetic field going in and then we will also here have magnetic field going in. Here it will be coming out. There. And so then here we'll write that the magnetic flux is increasing. So the density of lines is going up in this row and in this row we will consider magnetic flux decreasing. And let's just go ahead and segment this off. And so then when we think about our loops here, um, here where the flux is increasing going into the page, the induced field would point out of the page. And if we play around with the hitchhiker rule, we will realize that that means we have to induce a counterclockwise current. And similarly here, if we have an outward pointing flux and it is increasing, that means the induced field would have to point into the screen. And again, playing with the hitchhiker rule, we work out that this means that the induced current has to be um, clockwise. If the flux is decreasing, that means that 
we want to induce a uh, field pointing into the screen in order to try to keep the number of lines the same. So again, that's inducing a clockwise current. And then finally here, we're going to want to induce a magnetic field that points out of the screen to keep the number of lines the same. That's going to induce a counterclockwise current. So I recommend you do while you practice uh, using Lentz's law <coughs> is you literally draw this diagram on a 3x5 card and use it to check your work. You can ask yourself, which situation is this most like? Am I having an increasing number of lines and it's going in? And it'll look like this. It's a decreasing number of lines and it's going out. It would look like this and so forth until you can comfortably argue it for yourself, thinking about which way the induced field will point and use the hitchhiker rule. All right, now I did point out that we should be able to argue this if the um, direction of the loop is changing. So this gets us back to our AC generator. So here, exactly as drawn, um, as the loop is churning, the number of lines that will pass through the loop is increasing, pointed to the right. This means that we're going to want to create an induced magnetic field that points down and to the left. So let's just note that there. Um, like so. And again, by playing with the uh, hitchhiker rule, you should convince yourself that that means at the top of the coil, the current is going into the screen, and at the bottom of the coil, it's going out of the screen to make that happen. Alrighty, and then finally, um, as we look at this, we should see if we have consistency with what we've done before with motional EMF. So if you remember the problem we did in the previous video where we had the 100 ohm resistor here and we had um, rails a meter apart and we were um, moving a conducting bar down like so and we had our magnetic field going into the screen. We had worked out from the right hand rule that this would give us a counterclockwise current. Well now a different way we can visualize this is to say okay a little, at some time later this bar is going to be over here. This will have increased the area of the loop. By increasing the area of the loop, we've increased the number of magnetic field lines that go through the loop. So this means we will want to create an induced magnetic field that points out of the loop, like so. And again, by using the hitchhiker rule, we can work out that that is going to give us a induced current that is going around counterclockwise just like we saw before when we did this with motional EMF arguments. And it'll turn out that it'll always be the case that if there's more than one way to do this we jolly well better get the same answer either way. Physics has to be internally consistent and it actually, with a lot of careful work, you can prove that these two seemingly different looking approaches, emotional EMF versus Lentz's Law, for instance, are actually the same thing under the hood. Um, it isn't particularly obvious, but it is. Alrighty. So in the next video, we will get into Faraday's Law of Induction proper and uh, end with a, a fun little demonstration. Catch you over there.